Today we bring you an on-the-ground update from the front lines of helping survivors of Hurricane Helene, and we'll hear a beautiful story of healing from the pain of residential schools, and it all starts right now. Thanks so much for joining us today. And you know, it's October 9th, fall is underway in most parts of Canada. All the way. The leaves here are just starting to turn because we had kind of a longer summer. So it's fall, people think pumpkin spice lattes. What is your favorite fall activity that kind of gets you in the mood? It's kind of evolved over time. As a kid, I think like you, because we were talking before, playing in the leaves, that's always a lot of fun. But as I get older, I love to go for uh, early evening walks. You know, it's not too hot, it's not too cold. You don't need a big jacket or hat just yet. Just a nice sweater or hoodie. And just, I don't know, there's something crisp in the air. I know things are, are changing into winter. I don't know, but it's a very hopeful time for me. I, I really love that temperature. What about you, Cheryl? Well, I was going to say jumping in the leaves, but no, since but you stole that as a kid... You're still allowed to have liked to but jump I, in but leaves. But I haven't done that for years. Let's, let's be honest. <laughs> I mean, jumping in the leaves might be a little ambitious now, but um, I, I love getting on my bike still if I can before it gets dark. I also, because it's, it's not so hot, you're not yeah, dying. exactly. I did a huge bike ride on the weekend from... Fort Erie, Lake Erie to Lake Ontario and Niagara on the Lake, and, it, and there was a double rainbow over the falls. That's a lot of kilometers, right? It was about 50 kilometers, so okay. it was good. I was sore. I, I'm still a little sore, I'm not going to lie, but it was worth it just to get outside, have that fresh air, see the beauty of nature. I don't know. I found a little, a little um, uh, place to sit right by the Niagara River, and there was nobody, and it was just birds and water and... Joe, it was amazing. Well, sounds nice. <laughs> Sorry, I'm glad. I was getting lost in my, in my moment. Would you like me to continue? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, okay. No, please. All right. <laughs> well, we're glad you had a great weekend, and it, it was a good weekend uh, here, but in a lot of places in the United States, we know that it's not been a great weekend. People in the southeast of the U.S., uh, fall is looking very different for them. You know, big portions of the southeastern U.S. have been decimated by, you know, Hurricane uh, Her uh, Helene, and it's ongoing, and it seems that... It's not over just yet for them. Yeah, it's surprising. Everyone was surprised about North Carolina in particular, that the hurricane went so far inland yeah. to do damages. That's not normally where it would hit. And it didn't. It wasn't even a Category 4. It was just a tropical storm at that point. Yeah. You know, uh, well, I love that we as an organization have been able to, to step in and work with um, with Convoy of Hope down in the U.S. And um, you, you've you been working closely with them. And how are we stepping in? What are we doing there? Yeah, right now it's because people don't have running water or power. It's getting them food. It's wow. getting them clean water. It's getting them hygiene supplies to be able to clean themselves. Um, and their homes and just making sure that they are safe. And we're going to be actually talking to our partner on the ground in just a few moments. He's right in the worst of it. We're going to find out what it's like for him to be there and what is ha happening with that recovery. Um, I don't even think they've started the cleanup. I think right now it's just keeping people alive, literally. Yeah, well, I love what we get to do here at, at Crossroads, whether it's restoring people's lives, you know, physically from storms that they're going through or spiritually or emotionally, and that's what we get to do here. And right now we're gonna hear from Virginia, who like a lot of uh, many indigenous people across this land, they suffer terribly in residential schools, but thankfully there's incredible hope in her story. I remember the day that I heard, I saw the building I went to school in. I felt it, I smelt it. It was so eerie, my heart just opened and gushed with tears. I cried for two days. I can't believe it. And I thought, that's what we felt when we were there and we didn't like it. Now we know. The moccasin is made by my mom. Uh, it's made out of moose hide, and the beads that you see, she used a loom and she added the fringes to it. She made it for my birthday. I came from a huge family. My grandparents had 16 kids. We lived close together and we did everything together. 
We had a foundation of work ethics and preparing for winter, summer, and canned salmon, smoked salmon, and picking berries, and gardening, and in the fall time we did firewood for the winter for the whole family. It was a happy childhood until I um, grew up a teenager, and then they sent seven of us from Wutzat to Indian Residential School. Never heard of it. I never left what's at. I don't know what's beyond. I didn't know where these schools are, but we chose Kamloops because it had a funny name. We talked among ourselves and we said, we're gonna stick together, take care of each other. My first language was with Joe Dan, so I had to learn English. It wasn't a happy experience, it was devastating. They took us so far away. It was a 12-hour bus trip. When we got there, we must have cried for weeks and weeks, and we can't run home. Verbal abuse, humiliation, physical abuse. They checked us out and to see if we had no lice. The atmosphere was just horrid. So I just made up my mind Two weeks of crying, I can't get home to my mom and dad or grandma and grandparents, so I looked at my surroundings and I wanted to get to know. I want to get involved in uh, school activities, and that's how I um, coped. But at night it was, yeah, it was abandonment and it was a trauma leaving my family. Yeah. I'm from Luxilio clan, Dista, and my house chief is Henry Cecil Alfred Wadagit, and I'm with Joe Dan. Joe Dan have lived in a vast, bountiful river valley for many years. Our ties to the river is so deep. Our people feel that they knew that they are part of this river. The river is our source of survival, and wealth and culture. And that's where I was born. My husband and I built this home and we had three beautiful kids. As a young couple, we accomplished a lot, but there was something missing. Bless my in-laws. They took my little kids to Sunday school and we partied. One Sunday morning after Sunday school, my oldest daughter said to us, Mom and Dad, are you Kristen? And I knew I wasn't. I said, you go ask your dad. <laughs> dad said, nope. And then this little girl says, oh, okay, and ran off. That was a conviction. And we fought it, and we fought it, and we fought it. And then slowly I went to church with her once in a while, and I told Ed to come with me. And I guess the pastor saw us craving for something, and he invited us to for coffee. Is there any reason why you could not accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? And we couldn't think of a reason. <laughs> and he led us to the Lord that, that evening, and we felt it right away, the changes, the, the Jesus that we accept in our heart. He says, I want to disciple you for 10 weeks. I want you to get to know this Jesus that you just accept and what he has done for you. He made us learn two memory verses each week. King James read the Bible, stories, and when he uh, preached on Sunday, he says, I want you to take notes. I still remember the passages and the books. If I run into trouble, there it is. All the answer is there. So when he just finished, discipled us, and I miss seeing him come into our place, and I phoned him, I says, Pastor, where are you? <laughs> we missed you. And you know what he said? I want you to lean on the Lord now, not me. I did my job. Now it's you and God on your own. While we were searching, we were watching 100 Huntley Street. We love the testimony of ordinary people, how they overcame um, alcoholism, smoking. I thought, hmm, time and time again, that influenced us. 
My mom and dad, they all saw the difference. Being ourselves and just live a life, a good life, and dad saw that and he says, I want to be like you. I want to read a Bible. So there was a fellow in WhatsApp taught my dad how to read. And I remember one day he was so excited that he uh, memorized a verse. As I was growing up, I thought, my grandmother always gave like Proverbs to us. And they always give thanks for everything. The fish that they caught, thank you, Creator. The moose that they caught, thank you. Everything they are so thankful for. When I lost my husband uh, seven years ago, I came home, cried, 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 cried from the bottom. I know what, I was just bawling away. And all of a sudden, the whisper, I was laying there, he says, I know, I know how you feel, Jen. I know exactly. I felt the same way when I watched my son die on a cross, crucified, humiliated for your sins. I will be faithful to you. Trust me. So I'm still living on that. The process of reconciliation, understanding and acknowledgement what has happened in the past, achieving equality, which I hope in my lifetime, I hope to see it. And I also hope and pray that non-Aboriginal across Canada empathize with us and work with us and ask us questions. There are many that are still struggling with uh, as a survivor. I want them to realize that they are the most beautiful people that are made and they have reason for living. My hope is in Jesus Christ. He is my strength. What a beautiful story. And, you know, I, I want to really make it clear here at 100 Huntley Street, we do acknowledge those stories of residential school abuse. We hear them and we want to spread them so that people understand what happened. I think Virginia, what she had to say was so beautiful. Many survivors are still struggling and she wants them to know they are beautiful people mm. with a reason for living. There is a reason to keep going and healing is possible. And, you know, we want to yeah. help you on that journey. If you're somebody who's been hurt through residential schools and maybe you've gone to counseling, maybe, you know, you've tried, but there's still lingering effects in your life, mm. keep trying. And we want to walk with you. If you want just someone to pray for you, you know, maybe you don't have any words to say, give us a call, 1-866-273-4444. You can email us at prayer at crossroads.ca. We will pray over that. You can even chat with a digital pastor at crossroads.ca. Mm. But resources are there for you, and we believe you, and we want to help you heal whatever we can do. Amen. You know, telling stories are important here at 100 Hunt the Street, even telling difficult stories sometimes, because those are the things that bring healing, and we're so grateful that we get to be a part of it. Well, we want you guys to stay with us because in a few moments, we're gonna give you a report of what's going on in the ground as we're helping those who are struggling with Hel um, Hurricane Hel Helene. Stay with us. Do you ever feel hesitant when it comes to sharing your faith? This month, Crossroads wants to help you talk about your beliefs with confidence and joy. We're pleased to offer the book, Each One Reach One, Everyday Ways You Can Shine God's Light by award-winning artist, Fabi Mason. Don't worry about how it comes out. There's something about kindness that tears down walls. It makes a person's heart vulnerable and they are looking for a lifeline. This inspiring, interactive book is perfect for those longing to share their God story with others. Find your unique style of talking about Jesus and share your faith with excitement. And when they're looking for a lifeline, I give them a lifeline. When they express their need, I share my faith. Request this ministry offer with a donation of $40 or more or when you become a new monthly partner. 
Call 1-800-265-3100 or visit crossroads.ca slash shine. You know, personal evangelism is about sharing your faith in everyday interactions. And I'm going to set a world record for the fastest six-point sermon. Here we go. Number one, be intentional. Look for opportunities in your daily life when you're sharing the gospel. Whether it's a family, with friends or colleagues, be open to conversations about faith. Number two, build relationships. Genuine relationships are the foundation of effective evangelism. Show interest in other people's lives and be a good listener. People are more receptive when they feel valued and understood. Number three, share your story because your testimony is powerful. Share how your faith has impacted your life. Be honest and relatable, highlighting how your relationship with Christ has brought you hope and transformation. Number four, use scripture. The Bible is a powerful tool in evangelism. Share relevant verses that speak to that person's situation. God's word has the power to convict and to transform hearts. We're almost there. Prayer. Prayer is essential in evangelism. Pray for opportunities to share your faith, for the people you're reaching out to, and pray for the Holy Spirit to work in their hearts. And then finally, be patient and be persistent because evangelism is a process. And as we're patient, we're trusting that God is at work even when you don't see the immediate results. And so along with these personal evangelism also come practical evangelism. And that's when we, the church, we get to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Let's head over to Cheryl for an on-the-ground update of how Crossroads Cares is helping those affected by Hurricane Helene. It has been almost two weeks since Hurricane Helene ripped through six states in the southeastern United States, and the reports continue to document incredible devastation and loss of life. Crossroads Cares is responding with both prayer and aid in partnership with Convoy of Hope. Ethan Forhetz is on the ground right now in North Carolina and joins us with an update. Ethan, thanks so much for joining us today. Good to be with you again, Cheryl. Now you're in the hardest hit state, which is of course the surprise to everyone. What are you seeing and hearing yeah. there? Well, I mean, when you go down near where rivers are and what used to be creeks and you, you see uh, the level of damage that was done by, by what are fairly small creeks that became raging rivers unexpectedly. Uh, the damage is devastating. I mean, people's entire lives are wiped out. Imagine having to leave your house so quickly that you don't even grab an ID. You don't, you don't grab paperwork. You have to get out. So now they're starting from scratch. Their, their houses are, are, in some cases, destroyed. Uh, in many other cases, unlivable, certainly uninhabitable right now. Uh, but they don't have anything. They don't have a driver's license. They don't have any way to prove who they are. They have to start from scratch with all the paperwork uh, and, and just start to begin to get their lives back together again. It's, it's, a, it's a hopeless feeling uh, for a lot of people here because uh, there's just so much work to do. And where do you start? I mean, nobody's been through this sort of thing before that's, that's here in North Carolina. Totally unexpected, as you mentioned, uh, this sort of devastation, this sort of catastrophic rainfall that caused creeks to become raging rivers. I can't even imagine what that would be like. I don't think most of us could. Is there one story or person you met that has really stood out to you and impacted you personally? Yeah, there's a family. There's a family of eight, and, and, and they were struggling days after the storm went through. And the sheriff's department went in to do a well-being check, which they're doing a lot of these days. So they went in to check on this family, and they found in the river the six kids bathing, taking a bath in the river because they hadn't had running water since the storm hit. Uh, so the sheriff's department, uh, they talked with the parents, found out that they also hadn't had food in several days since the storm hit. So the Sheriff's Department is a, is a great partner of Convoy of Hopes. They contacted us and said, hey, listen, here's the situation. So Convoy was, was really able to take in bags of groceries, take in cases of water, ice for the family, hygiene items so they could bathe properly, and uh, really was just able to bless that family and, and really encourage them and speak life into them uh, because they were really just devastated by this storm and it was going on and on the recovery and and nothing had happened for them yet no electricity no water uh so it's stories like that that are really all over the place from it stretches all the way from florida up to north carolina virginia uh and it's it's really unprecedented uh what these people are going through it's so it does my heart so much good to hear that you're there that you're responding to those needs i know you've been handing out water food sanitation supplies is are you anywhere near the next part cleanup or, 
you know, still just handing out that food? No, right now it's the very basics because there's running water doesn't exist for most folks around this area uh, who are in the hard hit areas. Uh, power's out for a lot of people. So it's, it, we're, we're in the very early stages of what is going to be a very long term recovery. Convoy of Hope is committed to being here for the long term, long after the TV cameras leave, because that happens eventually. Our attention will turn, as it already has, to the next storm coming in. Uh, but uh, Convoy will be here to minister to, to the folks who need it uh, here in this area and, and throughout the six state area where this storm hit. Yeah, we're so thankful for that. And now, of course, as you mentioned, there's another hurricane on the way. Where is that headed? Of course, it's it's not quite arrived yet. And it can always change at the last minute. But what are you doing to prepare? Well, we already have a team in Florida, so we're on the ground in Florida already. I will be traveling down to Florida tomorrow uh, to be able to be there to ride out the storm in the Orlando area. So it'll be a little inland. And then as soon as the storm moves through, we move in and, and we begin scouting the area for locations. Uh, the good news is the Convoy of Hope has incredible partners all along the coast of Florida, both sides, honestly. Uh, so we're, we're down there a lot. So we've made good friends down there with several churches in that area. So we've got great, great places that we would be able to to park some of these vehicles not these vehicles because these are in north carolina these will be staying here we'll be taking a second fleet of u.s disaster vehicles uh, we don't have to do that very often but sometimes we're at two major disasters at the same time it looks like this week that's what the situation will be so we'll move in there we'll, we'll team up with our church partners and uh and the trucks coming from our our world headquarters in springfield missouri will keep coming with the supply uh and we now have a warehouse in north carolina where we're being able Nine trucks are arriving today, full semis, full of supply that will stock that warehouse so that we're able to handle all these distributions around North Carolina. We're working on securing another warehouse in Florida so we can do the exact same thing there, fill it with supply, and then from there, take the supply out to all our church partners uh, along what we think will be both coasts. It's absolutely insane that there would be two hurricanes back to back making landfall in the U.S. And we're obviously going to be keeping you in our prayers that you are safe. Thank you for being there. And even, you know, please pass our thanks along to the churches who've been impacted themselves and are now serving yeah. their community in such a beautiful way. And we want to invite everybody watching right now to join us in this effort. You know, the Bible talks about how we have to love our neighbor as ourselves. And there's no other closer neighbor to us than the United States and friends of ours and so many people that are suffering right now. We just want to stand with them and let them know they're not alone and do what we can to help. So I'm asking you to join us. That number is 1-800-265-3100. You can also go online at crossroads.ca slash Helene. It is urgent that we get aid right now and people have no food, no water. It is a timely ask and we need you to respond today. So please call that number, go online and do what you can to help the victims of this hurricane and help them prepare for the one that may be landing in the next 24 to 48 hours. Ethan, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for all you and your team are doing to make a difference. Well, we're blessed to be able to do it. Cheryl, thank you so much for your care and your concern and the generosity of your viewers. Thanks. Hurricane Helene has left a trail of devastation across the Southeast, affecting countless lives in Florida, Georgia, and North Carolina. Over 800 miles of destruction and more than 190 lives lost. Communities are in desperate need of help as they grapple with the devastating aftermath. Crossroads Cares is responding with prayer and emergency relief. Donate now at crossroads.ca slash Helene or call 1-800-265-3100. Thankful to be here together. I love our time in the Bible, love you very much, and expecting the Lord to speak to you today. What's our theme this week? Purpose, purpose. Do you have it? Many don't. Purpose is found in Jesus Christ. The Bible, again, points us down the pathway and the blessing of true purpose in Jesus Christ. We are learning from 1 Peter 4, verses 7 to 11. Man, I love this text so much as well. Here's what we've learned so far this week, okay? If I want to live a life of purpose, I must first wake up with urgency. Peter's like, the end of all things is at hand. Christ is going to return. Therefore, live in the mindset of that reality. Number two here, very, very important, and so biblical, obviously. I will love others earnestly. Purpose comes from loving others 
earnestly. Jesus said, it is better to give than to receive. Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to serve others. Jesus instructed his disciples, you shall wash one another's feet as well. Loving others earnestly is a powerful, powerful pathway to finding purpose. Now we must be very wise because the world says so often, no, live for yourself. Love yourself. I'm so tired of hearing, love yourself, love yourself. I don't I want to love myself. I want to love others. And that's how I'm blessed by God as well. So here we see in verse eight, Peter says this, above all, that gets our attention. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Why? Since love covers a multitude of sins. Above all, love. That reminds us of 1 Corinthians 13, right? For the greatest of these is... Love, yes, yes. We are called to love God and love others. This earnest love here, again, earnestly is one of the key words here. This means a stretching or a strain. It was used as a medical term, speaking of stretching a muscle to its limits. You ever try to stretch a muscle to its limits? It's painful, it hurts, right? But sometimes it's necessary. That is the biblical love Peter is referring to. Above all, loved ones, love one another to the point that it hurts, that it costs, that it stretches, right? Because true love does cost, but this earnest love is what pays massive dividends in purpose and the blessing of others in our lives. This kind of love is absolutely essential. Now notice in verse 82, one another earnestly for this love covers a multitude of sins. Isn't that amazing? What does that mean? Well, they can't mean that I love someone that I condone their sin against me. That's not what it means. It can't mean that I love someone that somehow they're not responsible for their sin. Of course they are. What it means is when I realize I'm forgiven in Jesus Christ, I extend that forgiveness to others. How do I know I have a love that covers, again, a multitude of sins? How do I know if I've truly forgiven someone. I've always been taught this and it's very, very helpful. I know if I've truly forgiven someone and covered them with grace over a multitude of sins of number one, I don't bring that sin up to them. I don't bring that sin up to others. And thirdly, I don't bring that sin up to myself. That is when I know I've experienced the grace of God and true love covering a multitude of sins. Is this love easy? No, it's not. Is this love possible in Jesus Christ? Yes, it is. Does this love bring purpose? Absolutely, 100%. Question for you and me today. Who can we love in God's strength in a special way today to find purpose in our lives? How can we love earnestly today? to see purpose flood our lives and not ourselves. Prayer Center is open. Love today. Can't wait for tomorrow. You are so blessed and so loved in Jesus' name. I mean, always a, a strong and practical word from, from Pastor Robbie. And all this week, he's talking to us about and reminding us that we are all called to live a life of purpose. And some people struggle with finding purpose, not just in what we're called to do, but finding purpose in situations and relationships, finding purpose, you know, in things that we're going through. Now, I'm thinking of all of our friends right now who are living in the affected areas of the United States by this, this hurricane, and they've got to be asking themselves, what is the purpose in all of this? What is going on? Well, I, I can't give an answer to, you know, to why these things are happening, but I know that we have an opportunity to respond, that we can find purpose in responding and helping. And you, you were saying earlier that that's something that we get to do, that we, we get to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. And so we're asking you, our friends and our partners across this great country, you know, to call 1-800-265-3100. And I personally, I love to go and live on, uh, give online. I find it very easy to give. And all you got to do is go to crossroads.ca forward slash Helene and make a gift today. And let's bring hope. Let's bring purpose back to someone who's struggling. Yeah, and thank you so much for your generosity. So many of you have already responded and we cannot thank you enough. You are the epitome of love. Amen. We appreciate you. Amen. Thank you for your ongoing support of Crossroads, a supporter-funded nonprofit organization and member of the Canadian Centre for Christian Charities. Thanks to faithful people like you, we are able to continue producing 100 Huntley Street. You can write to Crossroads, P.O. Box 5100, Burlington, Ontario, L7R4M2, 
or visit crossroads.ca to learn more about our programs.